So the headline for today's gospel could be, Wild Furry Thing Says Something That Makes the Cool Kids Uncomfortable. <laughs> Sounds a little like my experience of high school. At least the hard parts of my high school years where I stood up at Diocesan Synod as a youth delegate and said that if the current generation of church leadership didn't approve same-sex marriage, my generation would. And the part of high school where someone wrote my name in an ancient civilization's textbook on the timeline of human evolution. <laughs> Between gorilla and Neanderthal. Well, I keep my hair quite a bit shorter than I used to. At a quick glance, the easiest way to uh, apply today's gospel might be for me to come up here and call you all a brood of vipers and to start demanding repentance. Well, I couldn't find my camel's hair, so I'm not appropriately dressed for that. Anyway, I'm not here to call you a brood of vipers. I will talk a little bit about repentance, and I'll also talk about prophets like John the Baptist. Repent means to turn around. And it's actually something that we have all committed to do already. In our liturgy of baptism, during the presentation and examination of the candidates, there are questions about renouncing evil, followed by the question, do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your savior? This is a direct reference to the call made by John in the wilderness. So in one regard, we have all already made that turn that John has called us to do. In another regard, it's an ongoing thing. The way we live out our baptismal covenant involves the decisions we make on a day-to-day -day basis. It involves looking for the divine in every human being that we see before us. It involves looking at those parts of society that have become unjust and challenging them. There's a great quote from a theologian I like, Walter Brueggemann. A prophet critiques the current ways of the world, offers an alternative, and gives people hope. A prophet critiques the current ways of the world. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee? Do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. The Pharisees and Sadducees were devout people who studied scripture and who were very devout at teaching scripture to others. But both Jesus and John criticized them for being too wrapped up with the letter of the law and for valuing the status and privilege that their position gave them. In a number of ways, the very criticism that Jesus and John made of the Pharisees could be made of today's institutional churches. As a leader of a faith community, John himself could have eventually fallen into the very same pride that he was criticizing the Pharisees. But then there's that other part of Brueggemann's statement about a prophet. A prophet offers an alternative and gives people hope. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. John was talking specifically about Jesus as the coming Messiah, but there is something more generic that we can take from John's lesson here. John recognized that he alone did not have all the answers and that he needed to listen to others for the prophetic message, for the message of God. And when Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to baptize him, or to be baptized by him, John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. John greets Jesus 
with a great amount of respect and admiration. Jesus, this itinerant man who's come from a small town with little background, and in front of this whole crowd, John is asking Jesus to baptize him. It's a tremendous statement of respect. And it's in that moment of respect that the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus as he's coming out of the waters. And there's something else in this, along with a statement of respect. There's a love between cousins. And I think, I like to think that the story teaches us that yes, there are those moments that look grand and ceremonious, like a dove coming down as someone gets out of the water. But the important part of them is the recognition of love that occurs between these two people. The Sound of Silence is a song by Simon and Garfunkel from the 1960s. And I think it captures part of what I see here. I saw 10,000 people, maybe more, people talking without speaking, people hearing without listening, people writing songs that voices never shared, and no one dared to disturb the sound of silence. When I think of the words, I saw 10,000 people, I remember moments in my experience with church, such as standing before the diocese as a youth delegate, or standing before the bishop at my ordination. And when I think of the words people talking without speaking and people writing songs that voices never share, I think of the brash but well-intentioned words I spoke when I was 15. I thought of how empowering it was to speak before the diocese with more of a voice than I would ever have in the sphere of federal, provincial, or municipal politics. And I remember feeling grateful for that and empowered. But I also remember the moments of fellowship that were shared with other youth delegates and that I've shared with people throughout my whole experiences of church. So being able to speak in public might be one gift, but the opportunities for fellowship were our far greater gift. And in that moment in my ordination, when I was kneeling before the bishop, that moment that's supposed to be a connection of the divine, it wasn't just that connection because I was standing before someone in a funny hat. It was what spoke to me at that moment. The gift of that moment was holding on to many, many memories of experiences in church that had led me to that point. In that moment of silent prayer, the voices of 10,000 memories of the fellowship spoke in ways that no one could hear. And it was amazing. And it's that gift that I think these make these ceremonial moments really powerful. And it's that gift of love that I think John is calling us to. Well, we may have begun with the headline, Wild Furry Thing Makes the Cool Kids Uncomfortable, but maybe we need to change it. Wild Furry Thing teaches everyone to place their hope in the power of love, including the cool kids. Amen. <laughs>